Marxism and Freedom by Raya Dunievskaya, Part 1, From Practice to Theory, 1776 to 1848. Chapter 1, The Age of Revolution of Revolutions, Industrial, Social, Political, Intellectual. Our modern machine age was born in three 18th century revolutions, the Industrial Revolution, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution. In embryo, every major question of the modern crisis was posed then. Indeed, we are first now living through the ultimate development of the contradictions that arose with the creation of industrialism. The proof that our age has not resolved the contradictions it faced at birth is as big as life. The one-party totalitarian state is the supreme embodiment of these contradictions. The central problem remains, can man be free? The totality of the world crisis today and the need for a total change compels philosophy, a total outlook. We today can better understand the revolutions and thought of that era than any previous period, period in history. The Industrial Revolution had undermined the old feudal order. The labor of men under the discipline of the yarn-making and spinning machines, coke smelted iron, the steam engine, conjured up for the capitalist greater wealth than the discovery of gold and the opening of a virgin American continent to trade. Not even the loss of the colonies in the New World could halt the developments of industrial capitalism in England. Not so in backward France, where royalty and the vested interests of the old feudal order kept the fledgling bourgeoisie in check. 1776 saw the birth of America as a nation. It was the year of publication of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, which marked the birth of classical political economy. The impact that the Industrial Revolution exerted on English political economy the French Revolution exerted on German idealist philosophy. Under this impact, the greatest of the German idealist philosophers, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, reorganized all hitherto existing philosophy. These revolutions in thought can be fully understood only in the light of the revolution in action, particularly the development of the great French Revolution. There is nothing in thought, not even in the thought of a genius, that has not previously been in the activity of the common man. One, the French Revolution in books and in life. Despite the mountain of books on the French Revolution, there is not, to this day, a full account of the depth and breadth of the activity of the French masses. It is only recently that Daniel Guéret has written a truly pioneering work, The Class Struggles in the First French Republic, but this has yet to be translated into English. In 1947, there was published in America the translation of The Coming of the French Revolution by George Lefebvre, Professor Emeritus of the History of the French Revolution at the University of Paris, but that analysis limits itself to the beginnings of the revolution. The French Revolution was marked at once by great daring continuity and permanence of its revolutionary actions. There were great mass mobilizations not only against the royalists, but against the right wing of the rising bourgeoisie, the Durandists, and also against the left wing, the Mountain or the Jacobins, led by that best known of all revolutionary leaders, Robespierre. It is a popular pastime of liberal historians to say that 1789, which brought the middle class into power, was a child of 18th century philosophy, and they add that 1793 was only a work of cir circumstance and necessity. The inference seems to be that because the masses had no theory, they left no real imprint on history. The truth is that precisely the spontaneity of 1789 and of 1793, especially 1793, bears both the stamp and the seal of the demands of the mass movement and the method by which the masses meant to construct a new society in place of the old. It is true that prior to the revolution, the sans culotte, that is the deepest layers of the mass movement, had no theory of direct democracy. Neither did anyone else, least of all the philosophers. 
It is true that the town poor did not organize themselves as a conscious substitute for Parliament, but they spontaneously infused the old institutions, such as the commune, with a new content. At the same time, entirely new forms of association, clubs, societies, committees sprung up everywhere. By the simple act of not going home after voting, but remaining at the polls and talking, the electoral assemblies were transformed into genuine communal assemblies of deliberation and action. The sections of Paris seethed with life. They remained in permanent session. First, they met daily, opening at five or six in the evening. Second, they elected a bureau of correspondence to assure contact among the various sections of the capital, thereby keeping constantly informed of developments and coordinating their actions. Third, they watched and tracked down suspects and saw to it that the revolutionary spirit was not con controverted. Thus, on January 1790, they opposed the arrest of Marat and made their views known through actions to consolidate the gains of the revolution. On June 18, 1791, they adopted Robespierre's suggestion for the abolition of all distinctions between active citizens, that is, those who could pay the tax for voting, and passive citizens, or those who could not. Indeed, some sections had already taken matters into their own hands and had already abolished this distinction. The mass movement thus taught the new bourgeoisie its first lesson in democracy. By July 1792, the assembly sessions became public. Women and young people who were not eligible to vote were admitted to the galleries. In his work, Guérin shows how the sans-culottes instinctively felt the necessity to oppose their own direct, supple, and clear forms of representation to the indirect, cumbersome, and abstract representation of parliamentary democracy. The sections, communes, and popular societies, day after day, immediately expressed the will of the masses of the revolutionary vanguard. The feeling that they were the most effective instruments and the most authentic interpreters of the revolution gave them the boldness to dispute power with the sacrosanct convention. The people were so little enmeshed in a lifeless preconceived idea. They were so far removed from all abstract formalism that the concrete forms of their dual power varied at each instant. But let us begin from the beginning. Two, the Parisian masses and the great French revolution. July 14, 1789 signaled the most thoroughgoing bourgeois revolution. In distinction from the American Revolution which had preceded it, the French people were not struggling against a foreign enemy. Their suffering came from their own anointed rulers. The enemy was within. The monarchy, corrupt to the marrow of its royal bones in blue blood, kept the masses in poverty and restricted the movements of the young burghers. The nobility, landlords, and clergy lived in wanton luxury on the bent backs of the peasants held in bondage. At the very time that science had been set free by the rising commercial and industrial class in England, the regime in France tried to maintain serfdom in thought by prohibiting scientists from overstepping the limits set by superstitious faith. These contradictions and antagonisms reached a point of explosion and of unity with the storming of the Bastille. Glasses fused into or classes fused into a new nation to rid themselves of the old order. On the countryside, the peasants refused to pay tithes, sacked chateaux, burned deeds, and repossessed the commons. In the cities, workers and free burghers organized themselves into committees, clubs, societies, and communes to assure the destruction of the old and the creation of the new social order. The revolution began with the storming of the Bastille in 1789, but the feudal monarchy was not finally and completely overthrown until the working masses in the sections of Paris carried through the insurrection of August 10, 1792. Only then did the legislature decide that the new assembly, the convention, would be elected by universal suffrage. 
democracy thus was not invented by philosophic theory, nor by the bourgeois leadership. It was discovered by the masses in their method of action. There is a double rhythm in destroying the old and creating the new, which bears the unmistakable stamp of the self-activity, which is the truly working class way of knowing. This, in fact, was the greatest of all the achievements of the great French Revolution, the workers' discovery of their own way of knowing. The masses did something. They fought concretely for bread and clothes, for arms to fight the enemy at home and abroad, for price controls. The established leaders opposed. The masses then used the committees they had themselves created to impose their will on the assembly. They linked their demand for bread and work with their demand for political freedom and full citizenship. Necessity, not theory, forced them to act directly in the shaping of the new society, forced them to act directly in the shaping of, or forced them, oh, fuck. Their actions not only gained them their demands, but taught them who truly represented them. By 1793, it was not Robespierre and the Jacobins, but the enragé Jacques Roux, uh, Théophile Leclerc, and Jean Varlet. They were the true spokesmen for the mass revolutionary movement. Deputies of the mountain, said Jacques Roux, it is a pity that you have not climbed from the third to the ninth floor of the houses of this revolutionary town. You would have been softened by the tears and groans of the vast masses, lacking bread and without clothes, reduced to the state of distress and misfortune by the gambling on the stock exchange and speculation in food. Théophile Leclerc invited the, legislature, the legislators to rise at three in the morning and to take their place among the citizens who besieged the doors of the bakers. Three hours of his time passed at the door of a bakery would be more to train a legislator than four years spent on the benches of the convention. To Rob Spear, reason was the supreme being, but reason, said Jean Varlet, lived among the masses. During four years, constantly on the public square among groups of the people, among the sans-culottes, among the people whom I love, I have learned how naively and just by the saying what they think, or just by saying what they think, the poor devils of the garrets reasoned more surely, more boldly than the line gentlemen, or than the fine gentlemen, the great talkers, the bumbling men of learning. If they wish to gain scientific knowledge, let them go and move about like me among the people. The working class of France in 1789 was numerically weak. Yet these approximately 600,000 out of a population of some 25 million had accomplished miracles in the thorough destruction of the old order. They did not and could not at this birth stage of capitalist development separate themselves completely from the revolutionary bourgeois leadership. They had learned that only by their own mass mobilizations and constant activity could they obtain their demands. Robespierre, who had learned so effectively to mobilize those enormous energies against feudal and royal reaction, worked to confine the revolution. In the material and historic circumstances of the time, the revolution could not, in any case, have realized the equalitarian principles for which the true representatives of the Parisian masses fought. We cannot follow Robespierre in the course he charted. For our purpose, it is sufficient to note that he opened the door to the white terror, which took his life as it prepared the ground for Napoleon. The great French Revolution, begun for liberty, equality, and fraternity, emblazoned on its declaration of the rights of man, even as the American Revolution fought under the banner of the Declaration of Independence, ended in the consolidation of power by a new ruling class. This was a new exploitative class which, nevertheless, had a wider popular support than the feudal predecessor it so thoroughly destroyed. One without temporizing, the new ruling class gave legal sanction to and participated in the extermination of feudal tithes without indemnification. Two, where the peasants had seized the land to which they were formerly bound as serfs, this property of church and emigre nobility was nationalized. Three, the king was deposed and universal male suffrage was established for the first time in the first modern republic in Europe. The Industrial Revolution and the 
definitive taking of the land by the peasants formed the solid economic foundation of the new ruling class. This foundation assured the capitalists of remaining the ruling class, whether the form of political power was republic or empire. Half a century later, the young Marx drew from the French Revolution, from the mass movement, the principles of revolutionary socialism. Before Marx's birth, however, Hegel had already met the challenge of the French Revolution to reorganize completely the premises of philosophy. Three, the philosophers and the revolution, freedom and the Hegelian dialectic. Hegel did not examine the French Revolution directly. He criticized the philosophers. All of philosophy before Hegel, from Bacon and Descartes, through the encyclopedists Rousseau and Kant, was certain that it had worked out all fundamental problems, and that, unencumbered by the feudal order and the authority of the church which trespassed the rights of science, the millennium would bring itself. Rousseau and Kant did doubt that happiness would automatically result from the progress of science, industry. They sensed inherent contradiction and appealed to human emotions and powers, but they could go no further than an attempt to reconcile opposites through an outside force, that is, the practical reason of men behaving according to a universal law, the general will. Kant had written his critique of practical reason the year before the French Revolution. Though his enthusiasm for the revolution never wavered, he could not meet the new, unprecedented, living challenge to his philosophical premises. Hegel alone met the challenge. There can be no question of the impact of the French Revolution upon Hegel, nor can there be any question of the impact upon him of the division of labor and the subjugation of the worker to the machine which had been given such an impetus by the industrial development following the revolution. In his first system, 1801, Hegel himself boldly faced this great new negative phenomenon, alienated labor. The more mechanized labor becomes, the less value it has, and the more the individual must toil. The value of labor decreases in the same proportion as the productivity of labor increases. The faculties of the individual are infinitely restricted, and the consciousness of the factory worker is degraded to the lowest level of dullness. Hegel's description here is reminiscent of Marx's words, or works, but he did not see the positive elements of alienated labor, nor could he have seen them. It was to be some 40 years before the factory worker would reveal all his great creative energies and be ready to challenge the new order of capitalism. All Hegel saw was a wild animal. There is no more dramatic moment in the history of thought than when the young Hegel, describing the conditions of workers and capitalist production, breaks off the manuscript of his first system, which forever remained unfinished. As he retired to his ivory tower away from the realities of the day, his central theme of alienation, alienation was abstracted from the productive system. So profound, however, was the impact of what that labor remained. Oh, shit. So profound, however, was the impact of what he himself called a birth time and a period of organization that labor remained integral to his philosophy. We can see this in Lordship and Bondage, that section in the Phenomenology where Hegel shows that the bondsman gains a mind of his own and stands higher than the Lord who lives in luxury, does not labor, and therefore cannot really gain true freedom. Marx did not know Hegel's early writings, which were not published until the 20th century, but he caught the critical impact from, from the Phenomenology, which he summed up as follows. Thus, the greatness of the Hegelian philosophy of its final result, the dialectic of negativity as the moving and creative principle, lies in the first place in the circumstances that Hegel grasps the essence of labor, the true active relating of man to himself, as human essence is only possible through the collective action of man, only as a result of history. Marx pointed out that insofar as the Hegelian philosophy holds fast the alienation of man, even if man appears only in the form of spirit, all elements of criticism lie hidden in it and are often already prepared and worked out in a manner extending far beyond the Hegelian standpoint. What remained integral to the older as to the younger, Hegel, was the French Revolution. 
It had revealed that the overcoming of opposites is not a single act, but a constantly developing process, a development through contradiction. He called it dialectics. It is through the struggle of opposites that the movement of humanity is propelled forward. As Hegel formulated it in his philosophy of history, it was not so much from as through slavery that man acquired freedom. Hegel was not content merely to affirm the dialectical principle of self-movement and self-activity through opposition. He examined all of human history in this light. His patient, his patient tracing of the specific forms of the creating and overcoming of opposites is a landmark that has never been equaled. In my view, Hegel wrote, everything depends on grasping and expressing the ultimate truth not as substance, but as subject as well. Freedom is the animating spirit, the subject of Hegel's greatest works. All of history to Hegel is a series of historical stages in the development of freedom. This is what makes him so contemporary. Phenomenology of mind, science of logic, and philosophy of mind have to be considered as a whole. Freedom is not only Hegel's point of departure, it is his point of return. When individuals and nations have once got in their heads the abstract concept of full-blown liberty, there is nothing like it in its uncontrollable strength, just because it is the very essence of mind, and that as its very actuality. Whole continents, Africa and the East, have never had this idea and are without it still. Meh. The Greeks and Romans, Plato and Aristotle, even the Stoics, did not have it. On the contrary, they saw that it is only by birth, as e.g. an Athenian or Spartan citizen, or by strength of character, education, or philosophy, the sage is free even as a slave and in chains, that the human being is actually free. It was through Christianity that this idea came into the world. The young Hegel may or may not have had reservations on the point that it was through Christianity that the idea of freedom was born. But whether Christianity is taken as the point of departure or whether, as with Marx, the point of departure is the material conditions for freedom created by the Industrial Revolution, the essential element is this. Man has to fight to gain freedom. Thereby is revealed the negative character of modern society. As Marx's collaborator, Frederick Engels, pointed out, if man were in fact free, there would be no problem no phenomenology, no logic. What is crucial to both Hegel and Marx is that there are barriers in contemporary society which prevent the full development of man's potentialities, of man's universality. Hegel was tracing the developments of philosophic thought and used some head-cracking terms, abstractions, but the applicability of his method and his ideas go beyond his own use of them. Brought out of their abstractions, Hegel's absolutes have applicability and meaning for every epoch, ours most of all. Despite the fact that Hegel is tracing the dialectic of pure thought, the dialectic of absolute knowledge, the absolute idea, and absolute mind are not confined to thought processes alone, and Hegel did not separate his philosophy from actual history. For every stage of development of thought, there is a corresponding stage in the development of the world. This genius achieved the seemingly impossible because to him there was one reason and one reason only. Whether he called it world spirit or absolute mind, it was the actuality of freedom. He succeeded in breaking down the division between the finite and infinite and human and divine. His logic moves each of the previously inseparable divisions between opposites, between thought and reality, is in constant process of change, disappearance, and reappearance, coming into head-on collision with its opposite and developing thereby. It is thus, and thus alone, that man finally achieves true freedom, not as a possession, but as a dimension of his being. If to be aware of the idea, to be aware, i.e., that men are aware of freedom as their essence, aim, and object, is matter of speculation, Still, this very idea itself is the actuality of men, not something which they have as men, but which they are. 
Hegel's presupposition that human capacity has infinite possibility of expansion enabled him to present, even if only in thought, the stages of development of mankind as stages in the struggle for freedom. Thus, he could present the past and the present as a continuous development to the future, from lower to ever higher stages. This bond of continuity with the past is the lifeblood of the dialectic. Hegel envisions a society where man realizes all of his human potentialities, and thus achieves consciously what the realm of nature achieves through blind necessity. The truth, that is, freedom as part of man's very nature, is not something added by Hegel. It is of the grandeur of his vision and flows from the very nature of the absolute method, dialectical philosophy. To hold fast the positive in its negative and the content of the presupposition in the result is the most important part of rational cognition. When Marx said that the ideal is nothing but the reflection of the real, translated into thought, he was not departing either from Hegel's dialectic method or from his absolutes. We shall see this when we come to Marx's capital and his absolute, the new passion and forces for a new society. To hold fast the positive and the negative meant for Marx to hold fast to the concept of the self-activity of the proletariat, creating a new social order out of the old, miserable, negative capitalist society, which is in existence. Hegel did not see the creativity of the factory worker, nor could he have at that infant stage of development. He worked out all the contradictions in thought alone. In life, all contradictions remained multiplied, intensified. It would, however, be a complete misreading of his philosophy were we to think that because he resolved the contradictions of life and thought alone, that therefore his absolute is either a mere reflection of the separation between the intellectual world and the world of material production, or that he thereby remained sealed off from the world in a closed ontological system. Quite the reverse. Hegel broke with the whole tendency of introversion which characterized German idealist philosophy, where all other philosophers put the realization of truth and freedom in the soul or in heaven, Hegel drew history into philosophy. 4. Hegel's Absolutes in Our Age of Absolutes Every epoch has had something to learn from his most original thinker. Every epoch has had something to contribute. Ours most of all, as we shall see better in the final part of this book dealing with automation and the new humanism, the workers have been acting out Hegel's absolute idea and have thus concretized and deepened the movement from practice to theory. On the other hand, the movement from theory is nearly at a standstill because it blinds itself to the movement from practice. Paradoxical as it may sound, the greatest impediment in the way of the intellectuals discerning the new society in Hegel's absolute mind is their isolation from the working people in whose lives the elements of the new society are present. This isolation from new impulses makes them ask the old question over and over again. If Hegel went so far as to pose what is, in reality, the logic of a new society, why did he end by sponsoring the German bureaucratic state? He himself tells us the political reasons. We are not concerned with his personal reconciliation. Society, says Hegel, is broken down into opposing classes and interests. The state is not sufficient to maintain authority. It is necessary, therefore, to have a caste whose only function is to rule and mediate between the government in general on the one hand and the nation broke up, broken up into particulars, people and associations on the other. Marx tells us the philosophical reasons. In the Hegelian system, humanity appears only through the back door, so to speak, since the core of self-development is not man, but only his consciousness, that is, the self-development of the idea. It is this dehumanization of the idea, as if thoughts float between heaven and earth, instead of out of the human brain, which Marx, Marx castigates mercilessly, in place of human actuality, Hegel has placed absolute knowledge. It is here that Marx took Hegel, who was thus standing on his head and stood him on his feet, 
thereby creating the Marxian worldview of history, dialectical materialism. Because Hegel could not conceive the masses as subject, creating the new society, the Hegelian philosophy, though it had replaced the views, hold on, the viewing of things as things in themselves as dead, impenetrable matter, was compelled to return to Kant's idea of an external unifier of opposites. Hegel had destroyed all dogmatisms except the dogmatism of the backwardness of the masses. On this class barrier, Hegel foundered. He fell back into the rationalist trap from which he had so magnificently sought to extricate, extricate European thought. Bourgeois thought had reached its highest point in the development of the Hegelian dialectic and to use a Hegelian expression, perished. Herbert Marcuse is absolutely right when he says that the historical heritage of Hegel's philosophy did not pass to the Hegelians. There is a dynamism and a contemporary ring to Hegel's philosophy, which breaks through his abst abstruse language. Marx, in his time, acknowledged Hegelian philosophy as the necessary prerequisite to the proletarian view of world history. It is more than that now. It concerns all of humanity. For in Hegel's absolute, there is embedded, though in abstract form, the full development of the social individual, or what Hegel would call individuality purified of all that interferes with its universalism, i.e. freedom itself. Here are the objective and subjective means whereby a new society is going to be born. That new society struggling to be born is the concern of our age. Our age has been a successful workers' revolution. The Russian Revolution of November 1917, which seemed to open up an entirely new epoch in the free development of humanity, only to end in the counter-revolution of state capitalism. It is therefore our age that is preoccupied with the question of man's destiny. What happens after a revolution succeeds? Are we always to be confronted with a new form of state tyranny against the individual's freedom? Are, are our struggles for freedom to end in a new despotism as the French Revolution, which Hegel witnessed, ended in the reign of Napoleon and the Russian Revolution, which we witnessed in the barbarism of Stalin? In asking ourselves, how did the first worker state in history become transformed into its opposite? And can man be free? We are groping for a total and absolute answer. It is the totality of the present world crisis which compels us to turn to Hegel and his absolutes. Even, at his, even as it is the solid ground under the most abstract part of Hegel's philosophy, which compels the Russian theoreticians to deny him. As recently as 1947, the Russian communists felt the blows this dialectical method this dialectical historical method delivered to their barbarous methodology of assuming what they should prove, that theirs is a classless socialist society. In the name of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the USSR, Andrei Zdanov, Stalin's right-hand man, addressed a specially convened Congress of Philosophical Workers. He told them that the question of Hegel was settled long ago. There is no reason whatsoever to pose it anew. When we speak of the philosophical front, it immediately suggests an organized detachment of militant philosophers, waging a determined offensive. But does our philosophical front resemble a real front? It resembles rather a stagnant creek or a bivouac at some distance from the battlefield. The field has not yet been conquered. For the most part, contact has not been established with the enemy. There is no rec reconnaissance. The weapons are rusting. The soldiers are fighting at their own risk and peril. Having thus laid down the line of what he called the party character of philosophy, he then claimed nothing less than the discovery of a new dialectical law, criticism and self-criticism. Having substituted the subjectivity of well-ordered criticism and self-criticism for the objective dialectical law of development through contradiction, he then proclaimed, in our Soviet society where antagonistic classes have been liquidated, 
The struggle between the old and the new, and consequently the development from the lower to the higher, proceeds not in the form of struggle between antagonistic classes and of cataclysms, as is the case under capitalism, but in the form of criticism and self-criticism, which is the real motive force of our development, a powerful instrument in the hands of the Communist Party. This is incontestably a new aspect of movement, a new type of development, a new dialectical law. By 1955, the new dialectical law of criticism and self-criticism has still not laid Hegel to rest, much less the live contradictions in their totalitarian system. Hegel remains so alive and worrisome to the Russian rulers because they correctly sense that his concept of the absolute and the international struggle for freedom are not as far apart as it would seem on the surface. The Russian theoreticians think, or at any rate, they would like us to think, that the historical struggles for freedom stopped with the Russian Revolution of 1917. Under the pretense of separating the materialism of Marx from the idealism of Hegel, they proceed to mutilate Marx's economic philosophic manuscripts and turn Hegelian dialectics into gibberish. Thereby, they hope theoretically to stifle the new society striving to be born. They keep feeling the blows that dialectical historical method delivers them even as the continuous revolt of the Russian workers keeps undermining the bureaucratic power in actual life. Today we live in an age of absolutes, that is to say, in an age where the contradictions are so total that the counter-revolution is in the very innards of the revolution. In seeking to overcome this total, this absolute contradiction, we are on the threshold of true freedom and thereby can understand better than any previous age Hegel's most abstract concepts. In, Hegel's, in Hegel, the absolute is the vision of the future. Whether one accepts it as the new society or thinks of it only as the ontological unity of the human and the divine, the simple truth is that this unity of the human and divine is not up in heaven, but here on earth. His absolute is directed against what he himself called the emptiness of the absolute of previous philosophy. It is true that the categories of his logic, such as being and becoming, essence and appearance, necessity and freedom, do not, as Hegel imagined, have eternal existence independent of man. They are, in actuality, the reflection in man's mind of processes going on in their material world. It is equally true that the summation of Hegel's own analysis is that actuality, the true form of reality, requires freedom, requires man to be free. His doctrine of reality requires, oh, his doctrine of the notion develops these categories of freedom, and the true potentialities of mankind are thus counterposed to the apparent reality. It is this which gives the material ring to Hegel's idealist philosophy. In fact, the science of logic may be said to be the philo philosophy of history established by the French Revolution, namely that man in temporal history, that is, on this earth, can achieve freedom. Though Hegel deals only with thought, practice is of the essence. Indeed, the practical idea stands higher than the idea of cognition in the Hegelian system because it is not only the dignity of the universal, but is the simply actual. While all of Hegel's works end in the absolute, it is not, as we say, an absolute abstracted from life. In the phenomenology, Hegel begins with the sphere of daily experience, and when he ends with absolute knowledge, he explains it as the unity of history and science. Hegel's science of logic begins where the phenomenology ended. Absolute knowledge, that is to say history and the science of knowledge, once again undertakes the search for truth. In a word, history and the philosophic mastery of the forms of organization which history unfolds have reached an absolute only on the surface of society. First now they go from the world of appearance to the world of logic where they read the unity of theory and practice as the absolute idea. Hegel then shows in the philosophy of nature that nature has gone through the same dialectical development as the idea. Translated materialistically, what Hegel is saying is that there is a movement 
from practice to theory as well as from theory to practice. In the philosophy of mind, he unites the two movements, nature and the logical principle, on a higher plane, but admits that philosophy appears as a subjective cogn cognition of which liberty is the aim and which is itself the way to produce it. He shows how mind itself becomes the mediating agent in the process and adds that it is the nature of the fact, the notion which causes the movement and development. Yet the same movement is equally the action of cognition. With his absolute mind, Hegel has reached the climax of his system. Marx did not reject idealism. Thoroughgoing natural, naturalism or humanism, as the young Marx designated his own philosophic outlook, distinguishes itself from idealism and from materialism, and is at the same time the truth uniting both. Marxism may be said to be the most idealistic of all materialistic philosophy, and Hegelianism the most materialistic of all idealistic philosophy. Hegel said Marx could not carry out his dialectical logic consistently because he remained from first to last a philosopher seeking to trace the logical movement, not of the worker, but of the intellectual. Hegel had established the principles. He had discovered them out of the devastating critique which the French Revolution made of all previous philosophy. But the philosopher, working only with ideas in his head and in the heads of others, cannot solve the problems of society. He cannot create new unities. He can only summarize those already reached. He is always standing apart from the real process of nature, which is human nature working on nature, and constantly transforming it into a new unity with, its, with himself. The development of the dialectical method on new beginnings is to be found in Marxism. To develop the dialectical movement further, it was necessary to turn to the real world and its labor process. This is what Marx did. Official Marxism has repeated ad nauseum that Marx stood Hegel right side up, that is, on his feet, as Lenin discovered during World War I to pay lip service to the dialectic while at the same time to repeat tireless, tirelessly that Hegel is gibberish without Marx is to transform Marx into a vulgar materialist. If this was a baited trap during World War I, today it is the greatest perversion of all that Marx stood for. Russian communism is a past master of such total perversion of history. But what is one to think of the way in which most academic Hegelians have aided this perversion by barring an approach to Hegel through their insistence on keeping the secret of Hegel? The manner in which radical intellectuals have joined this twosome in transforming the dialectic into sheer sophistry almost assumes the, pro the proportions of a conspiracy. These intellectual cynics have learned to manipulate the dialectic to fit arguments both pro and con on any subject. They maintain, for example, that Hegel is the theorist of both the counter-revolution and of the permanent revolution. Hegel himself dealt with these types of philosophical lawyers who, with equal ease, can argue either side of a case. Sophistry has nothing to do with what is taught. That may very possibly be true. Sophistry lies in the formal circumstance of teaching it by grounds which are as available for attack as for defense. To declare in our day and age that Hegel's absolute means nothing but the knowing of the whole past of human culture is to make a mockery of the dialectical uh, development of the world and of thought and absolutely to bar a rational approach to Hegel. What is far worse, such sophistry is a self-paralyzing barrier against a sober theoretical approach to the world itself. It is necessary to divest Hegelian philosophy of the dead weight of academic tradition as well as of radical intellectual snobbery and cynicism or we will lay ourselves wide open to the to the putrescent smog of communism.